meeting of the Standing Committee on Government Operations to order. My name is Rylan Johnson. I am the MLA for Yellowknife North and chair of this committee. Today, Committee on Government Operations is holding a public hearing on Bill 66, an act to amend the Property and Assessment Taxation Act. Uh, as a matter of housekeeping, we will ask the minister to introduce the bill, and there will be some questions, and then we have a presentations from NWTAC and Northwest Territories Métis Nation following that. So there will not be, uh, will be no clause by clause today, Minister. We're working on scheduling that with you, and hopefully you can uh, do all the bills you have before us at once. Uh, with that, I will begin by asking members to introduce themselves, beginning on my left. Thanks, uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Caitlin Cleveland, Cam Lake. Uh, and Deputy Chair Martellos. Peter Martellos, MLA for Tabacha. And MLA Semele, I believe you're online. Uh, MLA for Anivik Twin Lakes, Lisa Semler. Thank you very much. Uh, and with that, Minister, I will turn it over to you for any opening remarks. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak to the committee about Bill 66, an act to amend the Property Assessment and Taxation Act. I'd like to introduce the officials with me today. They are Ms. Jennifer Young, Director of Corporate Affairs, Municipal and Community Affairs, Ms. Lori Fife, a Director of Community Governance and Director of Assessments, Municipal and Community Affairs, uh, Jeff Ray, Minister of Special Advisor, and Mr. William St Stevenson, Legislative Counsel, Department of Justice. The purpose of Bill 66 is to address issues that can be addressed through administrative and operational amendments without changing the overall, overall intent of the Act. The Department of Municipal and Community Affairs is using a phased approach for its review of the property assessment and taxation to balance the department's needs to move forward with its legislative agenda, while taking the necessary time to address more complex and substantive issues. Mr. Chair, Bill 66 represents the first phase of the review. The second phase is currently in development and deals with more complex property and taxation issues and authorities. Bill 66 clarifies and modernizes certain definitions and also gives the Director of Assessments greater authority in respect of the first assessment order, corrections to the roles, and carrying out sub supplementary assessments. The bill also updates provisions related to municipal boards of revisions, and territorial boards of revisions, and assessment appeal tribunal to extend terms of appointment to adjust decision-making timelines to allow for sole duration in certain circumstances and to change the title of secretary to registrar. The bill also gives municipal employees the ability to purchase property at public auctions with the approval of municipal councils. Mr. Chair, the amendments in Bill 66 are based on suggestions provided stakeholders as responsible for administration of the Act, including the municipal taxation authorities, the Northwest Territories Association of Communities, the Department's Director of Assessments and its Assessors, the Chair of Assessments Appeals Tribunal, the Chair of the Board's Revision, and the Departments of Justice and Finance. In addition to these amendments, this bill makes several housekeeping amendments that were suggested by the Legislation, legislation Division of the Department of Justice to general neutralize, neutralize language and fix non-substantial grammar, grammatical errors in the Act. Mr. Chair, based on feedback from committee, the Department is also proposing two amendments to Bill 66. The first will require the Assessment Appeals Tribunal to to decide on appeal within three months from the, when the notice of appeal is received, and the second proposed amendment to Bill 66 will require the department to publish on its website any yeah, variation orders within five days after the day of which the order is made. Mr. Chair, I look forward to hearing comments from committee and answer any questions that mem members may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you to you and your staff uh, for working with committee on the proposed amendments. We'll move those during clause by clause. I, I do think the bill is better off having a fixed timeline, and I also thank your staff for the patience in explaining the multiple steps in a property assessment review. Uh, 
with that, I will open up the floor for questions, comments from committee. Emily Cleveland. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, just in uh, looking at some of the, the changes that were made, one of the key changes that were made was that the bill gives municipal employees the ability to purchase property at public auction with the approval of municipal council. Um, one of the concerns that, um, you know, especially in the north where we all know one another is that there, there is potential for conflict of interest. And I'm wondering from the perspective of the GNWT how uh, conflicts of interest will be protected at the municipal level. Thank you. Thank you. Minister? i turn it to Ms. Fife. Go ahead. So, this will impact the six municipal taxation authorities only, because those are the only areas or communities that would uh, put a home up for auction and go through a two-year process that they go through based on the Act to put it up there. We will... Um, look with the community governments and look at their processes or HR policies um, to identify to make sure that there's no conflict of interest and if there was that based on their HR policies and the council policies that they would take, take conflict of interest into account. Thank you. Any follow-up, Emily Cleveland? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And so given that these decisions would be made at the municipal level, would these decisions also happen then um, in public with public reporting. Uh, is that fair to, to ask as well? Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Five. When an auction list comes forward, it would go to council for approval. So it would then proceed to go through a council meeting and different things like that. So it would potentially be that they would also take this process to council. Thank you. Any further questions, comments from the committee? Emily O'Reilly. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I just want to follow up on my colleagues' questions. I, I think the, the real question, though, was, uh, and I, I guess I'm going to ask you folks for your your opinion or legal advice on this, is that if um, I understand this, uh, the tax sales only apply to the, the six tax-based municipalities, and if those councils want to allow a member of their staff or council to place a bid uh, during the tax sales, that requires a public vote a re and a recorded vote of council uh, for that permission to be given. Am I correct? Thank you. Ms. Five? Yes, the whole process would pro follow through going through a public process with council. Thank you. Minister? Yeah, and I think we need to reiterate that we cannot tell Council how they develop their conflict of interest policies. Like, they have a process and we give recommendations, but at the end of the day, we can't tell them exactly how to do it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any follow-up, Emily O'Reilly? Yeah, thanks. No, uh, that's my understanding. Well, look, I used to be a City Councilor, so uh, um, I'm fine. Uh, uh, having councils make that decision themselves and I think that's the approach that MACA is taking but as I understand it it's going to require a public vote of council to allow a member of their staff or a member of council to place a bid in a, in a tax sale so they assume the liability potential liability and the responsibility the accountability for making that decision it, and it doesn't come back to MAC, it doesn't come back to GMWT, it stays with council. And if someone has an issue with that, they take it up with council, they can go for judicial review, I, I imagine. It, it, am I correct in, in my interpretation of all of that? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Minister? Real short answer, yes. Thank you. Any further questions, comments? From <laughs> Emily Marcellos, go ahead. So does that reflect uh, that in the bill? Because uh, I don't know if that, that actual criteria where council takes, re the mayor and council or any jurisdiction takes responsibility for that. Uh, I don't know if that's it actually in the bill. The other thing I want to uh, talk about is the, um, the document that came from the Northwest Territories Métis Nation questioning um, 
that lack of consultation uh, with bright space ca uh, cabins, and it's not only going to be um, the Métis Nation. This is uh, this is going to reflect on all the cabins that are right right based in the Northwest Territories, and the whole uh, you, uh, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So I. Um, has that also been taken into account, or is that coming with? Because uh, you say in in the document that there is two phases or to the to the bill, and there is going to be another in depth feedback on amendments later on, I believe, like or something, Bill sixty six. So I'm just wondering how we're dealing with um, with um, the indigenous uh, population with regards to Bill sixty six. Has there been in-depth consultation by your department to ensure that uh, they have been heard? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Emily Marcellus, Minister. Yeah, thank you. Uh, for the first part, I'll ask Ms. Fleith to answer, the, and then the second question, I'll turn to Ms. Young. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, from a governance perspective, we would promote good practice with a community government and their council. We don't dictate what they put in their bylaws or their procedures. Thank you, Ms. Young. Uh, for the <clears throat> excuse me for the second part of the question related to uh, consultation with Indigenous governments um, and First Nation councils. Um, the answer to that is we did not undertake that as part of the first phase of amendments because they were purely administrative in nature. However, with phase two of um, the amendments we plan to undertake, there will be engagement with those organizations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any follow-up, Emily Marcellos? I think that we got to uh, reach out okay, to uh, these organizations across the NWT. Uh, I think that we're at the state in our in our government in our in our government that we have to have they have to have a say in phase two, and um, I look forward to that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Emily Marcellus. Any further questions, comments from the committee? Hearing none, can we just get an updated timeline on what we're thinking for phase two? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we intend to produce a legislative proposal before the end of this assembly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, any further questions, comments with commi from committee? Hearing none, Minister Staff, thank you very much for your work, and we will see you for the clause by clause. With that, I will invite Sarah Brown up from NWTAC to make her presentation. with your presentation. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for the opportunity to come and present to you on uh, the and comment on Bill 66 as it relates to the Property Assessment and Taxation Act. Um, well aware of the division of the two components of work re relative to that, and we're 
working from that tacit understanding that everything else that's still sitting in our resolutions will be dealt with in phase two um, because we understand there's lots of research and consultation to be done and we're happy to see that's going to happen and heard it this morning already so that's great so we're only going to be commenting on what we uh, saw in phase one uh, first of all um, really happy to see the ability to address the issue of minor corrections to the assessment role uh, kind of crazy that they can't deal with typos and things like that before so that's great to see um, really pleased to see a fixed time of three months after filing for a hearing to be held uh, we've certainly been asking for that um, and with respect to clause 44 1 the timing for a decision should be based on performance standards and not a fixed date um, realistically um, if you had it's the original proposal and I understand that this has been uh, this has been a resolution of ours since 1998, and we do appreciate it being addressed. But um, and we understand that Mac has already received some feedback to that effect, so we're hoping that gets addressed. Whether it's three months or six months, I mean, it has to be workable. But um, to just have a fixed date in the calendar that you work towards didn't, didn't seem to make much sense. Uh, we do appreciate the ability to appoint a sole adjudicator. I think that's important in terms of meeting some of those performance standards. If we're going to set them, then we have to give them uh, ability to do that. And we would like to see more details on the Clause 97.81 with respect to the participation of council members and, and employees in uh, municipal public ta ta taxation auctions. I think there has to be more detail on that. It's a, to just have that singular clause is uh, not a lot of detail. Um, and as I mentioned, we certainly understand that uh, some of the work, uh, this is work for phase one and look forward to having um, uh, this second phase have more consultation and, and uh, time. And we would also recommend that uh, if they're going to be doing consultation on PADA, that they do it in conjunction with the senior citizens and disabled persons property tax relief the public does not perceive them to be distinct from each each other and a lot of comments will be made on if you do any public components and reach out to different interest groups um, you will be hearing about it anyway so you might as well combine it into one set of work um, and again I just want to thank uh, the committee for providing this opportunity for us to comment on on this act thank you very much Ms. Brown any questions comments from the committee Emily Cleveland Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, in regard, and thank you very much for joining us again. We appreciate all, all the opportunities to have NWTAC in front of us. Um, in, in regards to the point where um, NWTAC would like to see more detail on the Clause 97.81 with respect to the participation of council members, officers, and employees in municipal public taxation auctions, I'm wondering if we can get more information about what type of details NWTAC would like to see included in that. Um, and I mean, we just heard from the minister um, speak to the GNWT not wanting to be too prescriptive in directing the bylaws of municipalities. So I'm wondering if we can get more information on that one. Thank you. Ms. Brown? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to be frank with you, we're not quite sure what they had envisioned and so look forward to maybe a little more detail and maybe it needs to go to phase two because of that. I don't know. Um, they, they still have to, I get that they're not wanting to be too prescriptive and we certainly support that, but we need more detail about what it means and what it should look like and whether that ends up being some sort of guidance document or that sort of thing. Um, but just to have that generic statement is with no definition of what it means and what does permission from council mean? Is it a one-off? Is it a policy? Is it a code of conduct? Right now they don't, they're limited as to what the code of conduct has to cover and who it covers. So it could be, if it's not framed properly, it could be an awful lot of work for the municipal governments. Thank you. Any follow-up, Emily Cleveland? Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and I, I absolutely hear you on that, and we've had our own conversations in committee as well in regards to this one. Um, is there a, 
Is there an example that the NWTAC has seen that has kind of successfully laid this out, where they, um, where the association would point to this was this was done effectively that protected all parties uh, involved? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Mr. Chair, I'd have to do some digging on that, um, and certainly we would be prepared to to you know work with our our advisors on on that as well as part of if it was part of phase two to 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 try to iron those details out. Thank you. Uh, any further questions, comments from committee? Mayor uh, O'Reilly. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the presentation just um, a couple of points um, in the submission I talked about three months for a uh, hearing to be held on a, I guess a tax appeal and I think, I think you heard the minister say that one of the amendments that this committee wanted is not just a public hearing within three months but we need it uh, the, the amendment that we will propose will actually require a decision within three months so I think that's Probably better for uh, municipalities than than just having the hearing. This this will require an actual decision, so the municipalities can move forward. So I just wanted to make that point uh, clear. Um, and then, uh, like my uh, colleague on the um, concern with 97.81, uh, which is actually clause 22 of the bill. This is um, you know it reads that. Uh, no council member, officer, or employee of a municipal taxing authority may purchase on their own behalf any taxable property offered for sale at a public auction by the municipal taxing authority without the prior approval of the council. So I take that that means probably one of two things. Council's going to have to make a decision on a case-by-case -case basis if they're going to allow a uh, employee or a member of council to uh, bid on a tax sale, or they're going to have to develop a policy around that. And um, I guess I heard the, the, the minister's staff say that they're prepared to work with municipalities to help them with conflict of interest uh, matters. And that's what I think this would require is, you know, case by case decision or a policy on conflict of interest, and then some sort of determination under the policy about a specific instance where a tax sale takes place where someone might place a bid. So I think what this does is really put the onus on council to make those decisions and make sure that they they have a proper process or, you know, have properly considered conflict of interest. So, but I, I think what I'm hearing you say is that NWTAC would like to see some greater guidance around conflict of interest or um, maybe you can tell me what you're looking for here. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Here, yeah, I think I think to just have uh, that one line statement define the whole thing is, as, as you rightly scope it, it could be one of two ways: either a decision by decision basis, which you know, even little things like what happens with that discussion does that happen in camera on an individual basis, right? Because that could be one of the scenarios because it's a property issue and it's that property is one of the few issues that councils are allowed to go in camera for or is it a policy setting decision and and then council steps back um, from it and and there's no guide doesn't appear to be any guidance on that and I, I see potential for communities struggling and actually getting themselves in trouble without that and and I don't mean that they should be dictated to, but I do think they need some guidance about what what their options are as it relates to this. Thank you. Any follow up, Amelia? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. I yeah, I think I want to think about this a little bit more about uh, um, whether we want to make be a little bit more prescriptive about how that decision is made and so on, but uh, I, I want to thank the presenter for the points of view there. It's kind of making me pause a little bit. Thanks. Thank you. Any further questions, comments from committee? Yeah, thank you. I, I'll, uh, Ms. Brown, I'll tell you my hesitation is that I think, I believe you said this uh, 
specific resolution has been since 1998, and I think the, the minister is more than willing to kick this to phase two, that section, and we would just delete it from the bill. Uh, I'm skeptical about phase two ever <laughs> <laughs> taking another 20 years. Uh, and so I, I, I guess I, I would welcome your thoughts on whether this is just better to punt the issue to phase two, or I think you know perhaps there still is time for the department and NWTAC to come back with what exactly that guidance could look like, whether that needs to be legislative or whether it can be some sort of required by law. I, I just welcome any thoughts you have on, you know, kicking this to phase two versus trying to get it done now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the the 90, 1998 clause was actually relative to um, the timing issue and not having it to a fixed time. Um, and it was the performance standards and, and but we have had a lot of resolutions around this act for sure. So the more that we can clean up in phase one, and I have concerns and that's why our closing comments were about, we don't wanna see this drag on to the next legislative assembly or be at the end of it again. Um, and um, because this is this is really important to our communities. Um, yeah, there's, there's no, I mean, I, I on that on that final one, the the, the piece around um, participation of council members. I think if the language was a little tighter in there, and we had some commitment about what kind of guidance they might develop, I, you, I think you would probably could support it, um, and we certainly would. But um, right now, as it reads, it's really unclear what they mean. Okay, thank you very much. We will try and work with the minister and see <laughs> what can be done in a short time period. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Next, I have a presentation from the Northwest Territories Métis Nation. Can I just get a mic check from those members joining us from the Northwest Terri Territories Métis Nation? Yeah, good morning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is Shannon Cumming. I'm legal counsel for the NWTMN on some of the legislative uh, initiatives that GNWT is undertaking. Can you hear me all right? I can, Shannon. Uh, can you maybe just pop, uh, turn your video on and off? You're, you are frozen on the screen, but your audio is coming through. Well, you still appear to be frozen, but we can proceed with, we can see your presentation and we can proceed with audio only. Uh, Shannon, can I get clarification? Is anyone else from NWT Métis Nation joining us today? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be the only person appearing. Uh, unfortunately, the NWTMN negotiating team and leadership are in a main table negotiation this week, so they've asked me to stand in for them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, yeah. I never want to take away from that much bigger priority. So uh, with that, uh, Shannon, I'll turn it over to you to give your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be uh, appearing before the committee, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, so I've got a brief uh, slide presentation that the, the nation has prepared uh, for committee's consideration. And can I ask uh, to advance to the next slide, please? So it's a brief presentation. We're gonna start by uh, providing some background and just referencing the proposal for the uh, second phase of amendments to the act. Uh, our specific concern relates to the rights-based cabins and we'll speak to that this morning. And we also wanted to reference the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and time permitting, there'll be a, an opportunity for questions and answers. Next slide, please. So just by way of brief, uh, brief, brief, brief background, uh, the government of the Northwest Territories and the NWT Métis Nation uh, have a government-to-government -government relationship. Um, in, uh, back in the early 2010s, it was the Métis Nation that were among the first signatories to the devolution agreement. And so early on, uh, the Métis Nation signaled its interest in working on a government-to-government -government basis with the GNWT to, um, to forge uh, new relationships and to co-manage lands and resources in the territory that we share. So that's a really critical 
um, point uh, for committee's consideration that the NWT and Métis have been working with GNWT for many years through devolution uh, to try to uh, uh, bring the legislation in line with uh, the modern circumstance. And um, on, on this government-to-government -government relationship, um, the parties are guided by a memorandum of understanding between GNWT and then NWTMN. And the intent of that MOU is, is based on mutual recognition of the respective governing authorities, also a commitment to develop working relations based on respect, recognition, responsibility, and reconciliation. And thirdly, a commitment to constructive collaboration and to open and respectful communications. Next slide. So the NWTMN participates um, with uh, the GNWT and other Indigenous governments um, under the Intergovernmental Council on co-developing legislation on lands and resource management. In the 18th Assembly, members will likely be aware that legislation was passed on protected areas, on mineral resources, and the Environmental Rights Act. Uh, there was a hope that more pieces of legislation could be passed in that Legislative Assembly, but uh, those were the three that came out of it. Um, in this current Assembly, the parties developed a legislative development protocol to guide the work in uh, de co-developing legislation. And uh, we observe, of course, that the Property Assessment and Taxation Act is not part of these discussions. Next slide, please. So the second phase or the next phase of amendments, uh, it was it was helpful that uh, it, the uh, uh -huh. the plain language report pointed out that the legislation on property assessment and taxation is quite dated. It was passed back in 1988, and that this is the first phase of changes to address administrative and operational issues. Uh, but it's important for a committee to know that the NWT Métis Nation has asked for discussions with GNWT to amend the Property Assessment and Taxation Act to exempt Indigenous Métis rights-based cabins from taxation. Uh, those discussions have not uh, taken place or have not resulted in a successful outcome. And the nation, um, frankly, is disappointed that the proposed amendments to the Property Assessment and Taxation Act will not address this critical issue in the current phase. Next slide, please. So with respect to the recognition of rights-based cabins, uh, the Métis Nation have always stated that the Indigenous Métis have a recognized Aboriginal right to hunt, fish, trap, and harvest plants and trees in its traditional territory as protected under Section 35 Sub 1 of the Constitution Act 1982, and that the right to construct or occupy a cabin on land is incidental to the exercise of NWT Métis Nation Aboriginal rights. And further, that the taxation of traditional use cabins adversely affects the Aboriginal rights of the NWT MN, which is in direct contravention of Section 3 of the Property Assessment and Taxation Act. Section 3 reads, nothing in this Act shall be interpreted so as to affect Aboriginal rights. So for the Métis, it sets up a really difficult situation where in exercising their Aboriginal right to harvest and in constructing a cabin, uh, they run the risk of being subject to taxation uh, merely for the uh, reason that they're exercising their Aboriginal right. And uh, there's a long history in the NWT of Métis and, and Dene and, and Inuvialuit uh, being encouraged to move um, f from out on the land and to move into communities. And that has really affected um, their ability to exercise Aboriginal rights. Uh, in, in our territory, um, probably many of you know the history of Rache River, where um, people that resided in that community were, um, after the school uh, burnt down, that uh, they were um, basically told to move into, mostly into Fort Resolution and, and other communities. And so there was an example of how government action can really affect how um, indigenous people uh, live on the land and exercise their Aboriginal rights. So the importance of building a cabin uh, to practice Aboriginal rights is especially important because many uh, Dene and Métis in our, in our territories uh, now live in communities. Next slide, please. 
So, as as members will will obviously know, the the Constitution of Canada is, is has primacy, and um, you know the Métis Nation is of the view that the Property Assessment and Taxation Act um, provision uh, in regarding to taxation is inconsistent with Section thirty five Aboriginal rights and fifty two sub one of the Constitution says that the Constitution of Canada is the supreme law of Canada and any law that is inconsistent with the provisions of the Constitution is to the extent of the inconsistency of no force or effect. Next slide please. In addition to oh, what the uh, uh, what relevant uh, uh, constitutional principles and case law is provided. There's also, of course, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And Article 26 talks about implementing UNDRIP, and, and in our view, it requires GNWT to give legal recognition of cabins used and owned by Indigenous Métis. So Article 26 makes it clear that Indigenous Peoples have the right to the lands, territories, and resources which they have traditionally owned, occupied, or otherwise used or acquired. Um, they have the right to own, use, develop, and control the lands, territories, and resources that they possess by reason of traditional ownership or other traditional occupation or use, as well as those which they have otherwise acquired. And in particular, states shall give legal recognition and protection to these lands, territories, and resources. Such recognition shall be conducted with due respect to the customs, traditions, and land tenure systems of the Indigenous peoples concerned. Next slide, please. So the Métis Nation wanted to, um, again, thank the committee for the invitation. And while we un understand from uh, previous questions and answers that phase two may deal with uh, uh, consultation, it was important that we, we get in as early as possible to express our, our concerns with the Property Assessment and Taxation Act as it currently exists. And, and it's the view of the Métis Nation that the uh, the Act needs to be amended uh, in order to exempt Indigenous Métis rights-based cabins from property taxation to be consistent and conform with uh, the UN Declaration. Uh, next slide, please. So thank you uh, again, Committee. Um, it was obviously a very brief presentation, but we uh, the Nation, uh, again, expresses its apologies that it had other pressing business, but uh, it was important that we appear uh, before committee to to outline our concerns with the Property Assessment Taxation Act, and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions committee members may have. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Cumming. Are there any questions, comments from committee? Emily O'Reilly? Oh. We'll let Frida go. Go ahead, Emily Marcellos. Um, thank you, uh, Shannon, for your presentation. Uh, we we are, are aware of the of the uh, presentation and the um, and the letter that was written to our chair. And uh, I think there are there is going to in the future be consultation with all Indigenous groups that have have uh, that need consultation done in phase two. We're, uh, you know, I think we're just considering just phase one right now with Bill 66. So, I, I, you know, I can't go into detail about what phase two is going to look like, but it's more in-depth. And, um, and of course, uh, we, we do have concerns about timelines and, and some of these things that uh, the chair has already, been, has already expressed. I want to thank you for presenting today for the NWT Métis Nation. Chair. Thank you, Emily Marcellos. Any further questions, comments from the committee? Emily O'Reilly. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair, and thanks for the presentation. Um, I guess it's my uh, suspicion that uh, other Indigenous governments might have uh, similar concerns, and uh, I'm not asking Mr. Cumming to speak on behalf of anybody else, but is he aware of any other Indigenous governments that have expressed some concerns about the tax treatment of cabins? And any ideas about how this might get resolved? Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Cumming? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to MLA Marcello and to uh, MLA O'Reilly for their questions. Um, without being overly precise, I, I strongly suspect that other Indigenous governments um, have concerns with the potential taxation of their traditional use cabins. Um, as, as members likely know, some of the settled land claim agreements do provide for um, uh, cabins or camps to be exempt from taxation if they're on Indigenous lands. And so if they're not on Indigenous lands, the concern is that uh, these cabins may become subject to taxation. And for a lot of Indigenous governments, um, it can be tricky to get all of the land that, you're, uh, that you'd like to select. And it's possible that some existing cabins uh, may not be um, selected to become part of, of your Indigenous territory. And then that makes them susceptible to property taxation, which is, uh, um, uh, would be seen as uh, a huge um, problem for many Indigenous governments. But as, as um, MLA O'Reilly pointed out, I, I don't profess to speak for other Indigenous governments, but I strongly suspect um, they would share that concern. The other thing I wanted to uh, bring to members' attention um, related to the issue of, uh, of Indigenous governments that are currently in negotiations. Uh, it's a huge challenge when you're at a negotiating table um, because your, your Aboriginal rights uh, are not finalized by way of treaty. And for um, for Indigenous governments uh, like the Métis Nation that are in negotiations, uh, we have to ensure that we can address some of these issues through treaty negotiations or also through current processes like the co-development of legislation. Um, uh, there, there have been uh, pronouncements from the Supreme Court of Canada on what should happen when the Crown uh, deals with Aboriginal rights uh, that when the Aboriginal group is um, currently uh, negotiating them. So I wanted to draw committee's attention to the, um, the Haida decision from 2004, the Supreme Court of Canada, and they were considering the question of how to deal with uh, the interests and rights of Aboriginal people while they're under negotiation. And um, the Crown said, and it was that paragraph 27 of Haida, so the answer once again lies in the honor of the crown. The crown, acting honorably, cannot cavalierly run roughshod over Aboriginal interests where claims affecting these interests are being seriously pursued in the process of treaty negotiation and proof. It must respect these potential but yet unproven interests. And, uh, uh, and it goes on to say that the honor of the crown may require it to consult with and reasonably accommodate Aboriginal interests pending resolution of the claim. So from the Métis Nation perspective, we're very hopeful that in subsequent discussions on the Property Assessment and Taxation Act, we could deal squarely with the issue of taxation of cabins that are being used by Indigenous peoples for um, pursuing their Aboriginal right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any further questions, comments from the committee? Uh, Emily O'Reilly? Yeah, no, thanks. I want to thank uh, Shannon for those comments. Um, yeah, the, the, this issue of uh, cabins and um, yeah, is very thorny because although we're just talking now about uh, taxation, there's still the issue of whether lease fees and leases uh, are may, may be required as well. Um, uh, or whether there should be an exemption for, you know, um, uh, rights-based uh, cabins uh, or, you know, land use as well. So, um, I know is uh, I'm not asking Mr. Cumming to reveal anything. I hope, and if he's not comfortable asking the question, but is some of this the subject of discussions at the main negotiating tables uh, in their um, ongoing negotiations? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Cumming? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. As, as uh, MLA O'Reilly pointed out, I'm, I'm a bit reluctant to, to discuss um, uh, what's under active discussion at the negotiating table, partly because I'm not uh, participating at that table. Uh, my participation with NWT Métis Nation is on legislative initiatives that the GNWT is undertaking. So there are people more um, appropriate to speak to that than myself. Uh, I do um, think that the Haida decision 
did really, um, and in many cases subsequent to that, give um, the Crown uh, a really good window to try to deal honorably with the interests of Indigenous peoples. And as, as um, MLA O'Reilly points out, um, issues um, such as lease fees, while it's not uh, strictly speaking taxation, um, uh, for exercising their Aboriginal rights, there may be some creative ways that uh, the GNWT and Indigenous governments can come to resolution of that. Because I, I think uh, uh, it's likely that many Indigenous governments uh, will oppose the notion that they should pay any fee uh, to exercise their constitutionally protected Aboriginal rights. Thank you again uh, for the opportunity to speak with committee, and we really appreciate the, uh, the chance. Thanks. Thank you. Any further questions, comments from committee? I will I'll just provide some comments when they're going. I, I think we had Lansing before us previously, and for the first time it seems that they are trying to make some progress on this issue, and, and, and I think part of the solution is not simply just leases or fee simple title, but perhaps some sort of tenure instrument that recognizes Aboriginal rights users in their cabins. And I think, uh, as a couple members of this committee have brought up before, it, it is worth noting that all of the settled land claims have members who have cabins on public land still. Just because you settle an agreement doesn't mean you get all of the cabins. Uh, so you continue to deal with this, whether you are settled or unsettled. And I would say it is long overdue for MACA having the PADA piece, finance having the collections piece, and lands having the tenure piece to get together and come to some sort of solution on this. It is uh, long overdue. So those are just my comments. And uh, I will thank you very much for presenting today, Mr. Gummer. Are there any other members of the public willing to wanting to present today? Seeing none, uh, this will conclude our public broadcast. Oh, yes, Ms. Emily Martzelos. I think it's really important too. Well, while I'm in the public um, in the public forum, that uh, you know, it's been we're in our fourth year and we're on the home run here with this assembly. Uh, and you know, uh, we have to have access to the minister when it comes to uh, cabin leases, even in general with. Our, our non-indigenous population and um, and those that have uh, uh, cabin leases on it could even be like it's myself also okay because I I do have a lease instead of uh, coming under uh, right space and um, and and the in, there's lots of there's lots of the, there's many in the population they end up in the same situation as a lot of the cabin owners and. They would like to have a say in a public meeting. I've been asking for a public meeting since I got elected, and I've, I and uh, the minister has not come to my community yet. He's been here six times, but it certainly was not for a public meeting with the people of my community of Fort Smith. And um, and I keep on asking him. I've done it in writing, and there's always the well. I've been there six times. Well. Six times is for caucus, for other things, but never for a public meeting. And I think it's uh, we have it's, uh, it's the onus is on on the ordinary MLAs to make uh, our ministers accountable to how how uh, on on making sure that the public is informed about these cabin leases that are in question. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, MLA Marcellos, and perhaps it's uh, yeah committee has a role and trying to put forward some motions and recommendations on the numerous layers to outstanding cabin negotiations and getting the minister in front of us. Uh, with that, I will end this broadcast and Emily Cleveland will move us in camera. We'll take a five minute break, everyone.